morning. Good morning. So glad to see you all. So the three most important factors in realtor, according to realtors, if you're trying to sell a house or buy a house, three most important factors are location, location, location. Maybe you've heard that before. It matters where the house is, not how nice it is, how big it is. The location is always the major deciding factor. For example, if you have a, a small one-bedroom, you know, 700 square foot apartment, that might rent around here for, you know, six to six, eight hundred dollars maybe a month. But if you wanted to buy that in New York, a one bedroom apartment like that would cost you like a million dollars for something half the size of this auditorium. A million bucks. Now a million dollar house here in Newton, Kansas would be a pretty nice house. Uh, so location is what matters. That's the deciding factor. But having a nice house in a great location where there's a booming economy and good schools and all these other amenities doesn't really matter if you're not located in Christ. That's the most important location. If your name is written in the, the phone book of the Beverly Hills address listing, that won't really matter much in the end if your name is not written in the book of life. It's far more important. As we'll see today, uh, as we look at the churches of Asia in Revelation, it's far better to be in a poor congregation on the wrong side of the tracks, as it were, or even in prison. It's better to be located there as long as you are in fellowship with Christ because you're in a far better location. Turn with me, if you will, to Revelation chapter 2. We'll be looking at the second of the seven churches of Asia. Rather, these are letters that were dictated by Jesus to the Apostle John. He is writing these letters to the seven churches of Asia, Asia Minor, more properly, what we would call Turkey today. And these churches, among these seven churches, as I said last week, they, they really provide a great teaching opportunity for us because within those seven churches we see pretty much the gamut, pretty much the coverage of the different kinds of congregations that there would be. And we can learn from the good churches and we can be warned from the bad churches. Uh, and as I said last week, again, there's a pattern uh, that, we, uh, that we need to follow as we're reading through these letters. They stick to a pattern. Uh, so let's begin in uh, Revelation chapter 2, <coughs> beginning in verse 8. And to the angel of the church in Smyrna, right? These things, says the first and the last, <coughs> who was dead and came to life. I know your works, tribulation, and poverty, but you are rich. And I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested, and you will have tribulation ten days. Be faithful until death, and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. We see here in the letter to the church at Smyrna that it contains a profile of the city and a picture of Christ. It contains praise from Jesus for their suffering. There is preparation given by Jesus for more trials that are going to come upon them. There is also a prescription that will help them endure these trials. And finally, it ends with a promise of, of, uh, of victory if they will endure. And these will help us endure our trials so that we can also receive the crown of life that's mentioned. So let's look at each one of these points uh, in the pattern in the, uh, that we see in the letters here. Each of the letters to the churches in Revelation here begins with a, uh, it's something that reflects the unique characteristics about that city. So let's talk about the city of Smyrna and look at the profile that's given of it here. There's not much given in the letter specifically, but historically we know some things about the city. The city of Smyrna, again, was located in Asia Minor. 
And it was really in a prime location. It was a port city, so there was lots of trade from the shipping that came through. It was located about 40 miles north of the city of Ephesus, one of the chief cities of Asia Minor that we looked at last week. So the location, going back to that real estate uh, idea there, was about as good as it could be. It was a very wealthy city of commerce. And it was said to be very beautiful in the buildings, that it sat atop a hill like a crown, like a glittering crown on top of the hill. Now, when the Roman emperors began to enforce the idea of worshiping the emperor as a god, the city of Smyrna was one of the uh, early adopters of this, one might say. They were very faithful to the idea of emperor worship from the very beginning. Uh, and they kept this reputation within the empire when Christianity came around by severely persecuting the Christians uh, and being utterly devoted to the emperor and his worship as a god. So this is the setting that the Christians are dealing with here that live in Smyrna. Difficult situation to say the least. There's also a picture of Christ that is given in this initial, uh, initial verse here. The picture of Christ is actually refer a ref referring back to what we see in chapter 1, as Jesus is appearing to John, as he's explaining who he is and, and uh, preparing him for the visions that he's about to have him write down. Uh, but in, in Revelation 1 and verse 17, the last part of that verse, Jesus says, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am he who lives and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of Hades and of death. So that image of Christ there is sort of referred to here uh, as he is speaking to the church in Smyrna. Uh, he says, uh, these things says the first and the last who was dead and has come to life. Uh, the city of Smyrna was sometimes referred to as the first of Asia, the idea of the, the preeminent, the, the top of the heap. Christ is affirming that he is first and foremost of, a, of all things. And he, like the Christians in Smyrna, was persecuted, even to death. And he was resurrected. So in giving this description of himself, for John to write to them, he says, Those who are with me follow the first and the last. The one who was dead and has come to life. So he's giving them hope that he was victorious, he was resurrected, and they will share in that if they follow him. There is hope for them in this difficult situation that they are in. So they, they have suffered greatly. And Jesus begins his letter, as he often does, by praising them. So he has some good things to say, as, as following the pattern of the churches, uh, the letters to the churches here in Revelation, chapter 2 and 3. So he begins with praise. And he tells them, I know all the things that you're suffering. That's just great comfort in that, in and of itself right there. Jesus says, I know what you're going through. There's many times in our life we're struggling, we're confused, we're frustrated, we're angry, we don't know what to do, and it doesn't feel like anyone else understands either. We don't have anyone that we can talk to, anyone that we can lean on. Jesus says, I know all about the situation you're going through, and he alone can help. We just sang that song. I'm glad you chose that. I must tell Jesus one of my favorite hymns, and it's very true. The Christians here, to look to Jesus and know that he understands all that they're struggling with. Jesus says, I know what you're going through. I know your tribulation. That word uh, was described by one writer as a burden that crushes. Tribulation, not just difficult times, but extremely difficult. A burden that crushes. That, that image is, is certainly found here with the Christians in Smyrna because they are caught really between the hammer and the anvil here. Because they're caught between the Jews. There are Jews in Smyrna who see Christians as a rebel sect. They say, you, you've gone away from the law of Moses. You, you've departed from God into a, into a heresy. You've twisted the true religion into something false by following this false Messiah, Jesus. So they were, they were antagonistic toward them. And then, of course, we have the pagans in the city who hated the Christians because they were going against the worship of the emperor, following another god in, in preference to the emperor. And that was going to get everybody in trouble. It was going to threaten their economic security. So they were getting it from two different directions. And Jesus says, I know the hard place that you find yourself in. He said, I know your poverty. This 
was a city that was filthy rich because of the commerce and the trade, and yet the Christians in the city are very poor. They weren't uh, given much benefit of the wealth of the city. They were poor. Jesus says, I know this. I understand. We see something in Scripture many times, particularly in the book of Psalms and in Proverbs. Uh, but this pattern runs uh, throughout the Bible. There, the idea of this, this unfairness, this imbalance, this inequality, where the righteous will often cry out to God and say, Lord, it looks like the wicked are, are doing great. It looks like they're getting away with it. Like they're avoiding judgment. Here we are trying to do the right thing and we're suffering for it in a physical, limited, earthly, material sense. Jesus says, I know what you're going through. I know the poverty that you are subject to. In spite of, so you see people literally across the street that are just living a great life. But they're in sin. And it doesn't seem fair. It doesn't seem right. Jesus understands that. He recognizes that conflict. They're not just lower middle class economically. These people are destitute. They're broke. I heard a comedian once talking about his, his upbringing and how they were uh, hurt for money a lot of times. He said, we weren't poor. We were po. P.O. He said, because we couldn't even afford the O.R. That's kind of the situation of the people in Smyrna, the Christians. They had their property seized simply for the fact that they were Christians. You know, a Roman troop would come up to the door and say, are you Christians? Do you follow Christ? And they would say, yes. And they'd say, I'm taking all your stuff. You're, uh, you're in rebellion to the to, the, to Caesar. You're traitors to the uh, to the empire, so we're going to go in and confiscate all your stuff as criminals. And there's nothing they could do to stop them. The Hebrew writer in chapter 10 of Hebrews uh, talks to the Christians there, and he said that they had joyfully accepted the plundering of their property. And the reason why they did that was because they knew that they had a better, more enduring possession in heaven, is the way he worded it. So he's really just expressing what Jesus talked about in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 6, when he encouraged us to lay up our treasures in heaven and not upon the earth. So these Christians, their treasures in, uh, on earth are being taken from them. They don't have any other treasures except those in heaven. And Jesus said that they are of surpassing value. So he knows the poverty, the difficulty they face every day, the struggles, the day-to-day -day effort just to make ends meet, just to put food on the table. Jesus says, I know what you're going through, and there's comfort in that. The Christian, no matter how poor they are physically, they are rich in Christ. James chapter 2 and verse 5 says that, Do you not know that God has chosen the poor of the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom? Maybe a struggle down here during this physical, earthly life. But he said, there will be riches in heaven. Hard to wait for that sometimes, though, when things are so difficult here. <clears throat> But we need to be encouraged by that just as the church in Smyrna surely was by the words of Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 9. Paul writes, For you know that the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that through you, uh, that you through his poverty might become rich. Jesus didn't live a life of luxury. He lived in a backwater town, in a, in a, a nothing little village, in the, in the household of a carpenter, a blue-collar family, we might say. He didn't grow up in a palace. So when he says, I know the struggle, he means it. Jesus says, I know your tribulation, I know your poverty, and I know your sincerity. He's, he's praising the church for the depth and the honesty of their faith. He says, there's blasphemy going on in that city, and Jesus was aware of that as well. I know the blasphemy. He says, of those who call themselves Jews, call themselves followers of the one true God. But in reality, he says, they are a synagogue of Satan. Because we have to think about what's going on. John is writing, as best as we can determine, in probably the mid-90s of the first century. So this is, you know, 50 years after Jesus has preached his ministry. This is uh, at least a couple of generations after the writing of the apostles and the, the books of the New Testament. So if there were Jews who truly followed the God of the Old Testament, they should have put two and two together and seen that Jesus was that promised Messiah. They should have become Christians by now. Paul wrote in, the, in his letter to the Galatian church that the law was intended to bring people to Christ. He said the law was our tutor, our schoolmaster, to bring us 
to a knowledge of Christ. The law should have brought them to Christ by now, and if it hadn't, it was because of their own stubbornness and rejection. But Paul said, they may claim to be Jews, faithful to the one true God, but they are in rebellion. Isaiah chapter 29, verse 13, is a verse that Jesus referred to, uh, to those who, who said, those who will draw near to God with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They say the right things. They claim the right things. But their hearts aren't in it. It's an empty faith. Today, just as it was back in those days, there are many who would say they are Christians, but their actions prove otherwise. We don't have to look too far to see examples. Maybe once in a while, all we have to do is look in the mirror. That's a really short journey, isn't it? Sometimes we don't do what we say we ought to do. That's true of everybody, but in, in every time, there are those who would claim to be uh, followers of God, but their actions prove otherwise. We have an example just not very far from here, over in Park City. Uh, the man who, who came to be known as the BTK killer. He was a deacon in a denomination. You know, a good Christian, according to the neighbors. As far as they knew, but you know, this man's heart was as black as the pits of hell. Even Satan passes himself off as an angel of light. He's not, but he tries to be. He tries to fool people that he is. So Jesus is telling the Christians, you guys are the real deal. And I appreciate that. Not like those others who only pay lip service to God. So he praises them for their sincere faith and everything that it cost him. I love how Jesus refers to I don't love it, I suppose. It's interesting that, uh, when Jesus refers to them as a synagogue of Satan. He's not mincing words here, is he? Jesus knows who is truly for Christ and who is against him. Jesus is the judge of the world and he knows exactly what their deeds deserve as far as punishment. He doesn't pull any punches here. Jesus ruffles feathers. He steps on toes when necessary to provoke people to repent. So he calls a spade a spade here. And again in doing so he's recognizing the, the faith and the integrity of the Christians in Smyrna. Jesus had no tolerance for fakes then or now. But he has nothing against the Christians in Smyrna. You see a pattern again in, the, in these letters to the churches where there will be a praise. He said, here's some things you're doing right. And then Jesus will say, but I have this against you. And then he'll list some problems and he'll be corrected. There's no problem in Smyrna. This is one of the churches where there is no rebuke. So in the place where there would be a problem to be addressed, there is simply a preparation that Jesus gives here for the suffering that they are about to endure. He wants to prepare them for even more persecution. So he gives them a warning of the suffering that they're going to endure. And we, some people don't like to be warned. If you tell somebody they're falling off, you know, they're about ready to walk off a cliff, they'll say, well, how dare you judge me? You don't know where I'm going. How, how dare you uh, criticize my choice of path? I'll walk where I want to walk. Go right off the edge. Some people don't like to be corrected, even when it's in their best interest. So giving a warning is, is a blessing. It's a sign of love. Jesus said, I want you to know this is coming so you can be prepared for it. So we can know what to expect. He told the apostles this in the upper room. Uh, in John chapter 16 and verse 4, he said, I'm telling you these things before they happen so that when they do happen, you will remember that I told you about them. What does that do? Well, it increases their faith. They come into a circumstance and they say, oh, Jesus told us this was going to happen. Oh, well, if he knew that was going to happen, then he knows everything else that's going to happen. So we can have confidence in everything he told us to do, everything else he told us was coming. It builds faith and confidence in Jesus. And that's what he's wanting to do here. He's saying, keep hold of that faith. I know what's coming, and I'm going to warn you ahead of time so you can prepare yourself. So he gives them a warning of the suffering that's coming. He also gives the source of the suffering. He tells them where this is going to come from. It's going to be coming from the Romans, from the empire. They're going to be persecuting them. They have been, and that will continue. Maybe even ramp up a bit. It's also going to come from the Jews. He said there's Jews out there that, that are really the agents of Satan. Uh, similar to what Jesus had said that back in John chapter 8 when there were the Pharisees who came, and he called them the brood of Satan. He said, you do the things of your father. You're not, you're not sons of God. They, they were calling themselves sons of Abraham. He said, you're not sons of Abraham. You're not even sons of God. You're sons of Satan. Because you're doing the things of your father. 
So Jesus tells them the source. Again, the information is good to have. It could be, it could be confusing to say where are these, you know, what, 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 where are these attacks going to come from? Jesus has told them where to be looking, what direction to be looking to prepare themselves. He also gives them the purpose of their suffering. Not just the suffering is going to come, but he tells them what it's going to do, why it's coming, the goal of it, the purpose of it. Sometimes suffering doesn't seem to have a purpose. God, why is this happening? I don't understand. How is this going to help me grow as a Christian? How is this going to benefit me? How is this going to glorify you and advance your kingdom? It doesn't make sense to me. Jesus is trying to shed a little light on that to give them the strength to endure. He says it's going to be for the testing of your faith. God is not trying to get us to fail. God doesn't want to give us an F on our exam paper. The testing of our faith is a tempering. You take steel and you temper it. What do you have to do? You have to put it in the fire. You have to heat it up. It's an uncomfortable process. But that heating process locks the molecules into a way that is very strong. And it makes that steel stronger. Tempered steel. Very strong. We need to have a tempered faith. He's trying to toughen his people. Not break us. He doesn't want us to break. He's trying to keep us from breaking by making us stronger. But that process is uncomfortable. There's also the idea of refining Something we find many many places throughout Scripture, the, the refining fire, the burning out of impurities. God has to sort of burn some of those impurities out of us sometimes to make it that pure gold, that pure 24 karat gold, shining with no flip, no blemish. That process is difficult and painful. So Jesus is saying, we're not God isn't sending all of the suffering on you just to make your lives harder. He's not trying to grind you into the into the ground. He's trying to toughen you up so that you can endure and so that you can overcome. Finally, he gives them the period of suffering. He said, this period of suffering will come for ten days, he said. Now, he's not talking about literal days. The book of Revelation is, is written in a style of what's called apocalyptic writing. It's very poetic. Uh, it's very uh, imagery heavy, very illustrative analogies. Uh, and without going into a great detail of uh, the, the, uh, the symbols and the numerology that's found. The number 10 is, is, a, is a number of completeness. So when he said you're going to have suffering 10 days, he said it's going to be an extended period of time, but it's going to be a set period of time. You'll have suffering for 10 days. It's not going to be forever. It may feel like it's going to be forever. It may feel like it's never going to get better, but he said that period will come to an end. And really, 10 days in the eyes of God is a very brief period of time. Now, God's timeline and our timeline rarely match up very well. But again, the idea here is it's going to be 10 days, not 10 months or even 10 years of suffering. 10 days, a brief period, a complete period of time, but it will come to an end. So Jesus has no problem with the church. He's given them a preparation for the suffering that's going to come upon them. He warns them to give them hope and the strength to endure, and then he gives them instructions about what it will take to get through this period of suffering. He gives the, the prescription. Here's the instructions. Here's what you do. Here's how you overcome. First thing he says, very importantly, is do not fear. It's easy for us to mistrust God. It's easy for us to be afraid. It's easy for us to be like Peter when we're where we're, we've got our eyes on Jesus and we're following him, we're walking on water, we're doing things we never thought we could do, and all of a sudden we glance around and see the waves and the wind and the storm, and we get afraid, and we say, I really should, should I be really doing this? Can I really be doing this? Is this what God wants me to do? The world will try to distract us and turn our eyes away, and Jesus says, do not fear. This is given grammatically in what's called the imperative case, so that means this is a command. Jesus isn't simply trying to reassure them, but he's giving them a command. I command you, do not fear. But he's doing this in a stern way, but he's doing it in a very loving way. Also, he's saying, trust me. You don't have reason to fear because I know what I'm doing, and I know it's for your good. So he's saying, trust me. The same way a parent would, would calm a child. A child is about ready to go back into a surgery, perhaps. And that child is terrified, never been in this situation before. Gonna be away from mom and dad. I'm in a strange place with strange people. I don't know what's going on. The parent would say to that child, You need to go and have this surgery. It's very important. You need to go. But I'll be here when you wake up. Jesus says, Do not fear. If you're gonna be afraid, 
But he'll be there at the end of it. And he tells them, be faithful unto death. That's how you get through this persecution. Be faithful unto death. The suffering that they're going to endure would be a severe test for some. Even to the point of death. But Jesus said he will give them the strength to endure. He gives all of us the strength to endure. That's what Paul was writing about in Philippians 4.13 when he says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That wasn't just Paul. That's every Christian. Whatever we face, whatever we go through, Jesus has promised to give us the strength to do and to get through it. And finally, he says, hear what the Spirit says. Seems like a kind of a throwaway statement. But it's very important. Jesus tells the church in Smyrna, hear what the Spirit says. This isn't just the advice of some random person. He said, this message comes from the mouth of God himself, from the Spirit of God. And how does, how do we hear what the Spirit says? How would the church hear what the Spirit was saying? Well, it was through the letter that John was going to write to them. God speaks to us through his word. His Spirit comes to us through his word. So we read it and we trust it to be true. And we will overcome as well. We will endure all this suffering and come out victorious if we hear what the Spirit says and trust. We need to have faith that we will be delivered and we will be rewarded. This isn't just about enduring, but it's about reaching the end and, and finding that reward. God doesn't want us just to suffer for the sake of suffering. But he's willing to reward us if we do. Finally, this morning, there's the promise. And in the promise that he gives him, there is a picture of heaven. There's, there was a picture of the city of the earthly, of the physical. And now he says, let's, let's look to another place. We see a picture of heaven here. The promise that is given is in each of these letters, part of the pattern. There is a promise, there is a reward that is given. Each one is different. Here there is mentioned the crown of life. Be faithful unto death and I will give you the crown of life. This is mentioned over in James chapter 1 and verse 12. James writes, Blessed is the man who endures temptation." For when he has been approved, when he has gone through the test successfully, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. The crown of life. What that means is it is, the, it is a crown which consists of life. The crown is life itself, eternal life. That is the gift. That is the blessing. Going back to the description of the city of Smyrna, again, it was described as, a, as a, a city that sat like a jeweled crown on the hill. Jesus says, the city looks like a nice, pretty crown up there, doesn't it? Well, I'll give you a crown of true life, eternal life. It would be far more valuable. And this reward is for he who overcomes. He said, to the one who overcomes, I will give the crown of life. What that means is that not everybody will overcome. Not everybody will receive this crown, but some will. It's possible. It's doable. You could attain it. And the promise given through this crown of eternal life is that they will not be hurt by the second death. There are some in Smyrna who would be martyred. They would die for their faith. But even if the Christians didn't physically die for their faith there, they would all die the first death, that physical death. But if they were faithful, they would not be hurt by the second death. The second death referring to what we read right later in Revelation chapter 20, verse 14, about the lake of fire at the judgment, the place reserved for Satan and his angels and for those who would follow him. He said, if you follow me, if you're faithful unto death, that first physical death, then you'll not be hurt by the second death. This, the spiritual death that Jesus referred to in Matthew chapter 10, and verse 28, eternal life in the presence of God in contrast to eternal death, eternal separation from God. Remain faithful till death, and you'll not be touched by the second death, but live forever. The vision of Christ in the beginning was one who died and had come to life. The church in Smyrna was going to face persecution, even to death. But Jesus uh, encourages them by commanding them not to fear. The death that they would suffer is only temporary and it would lead them into eternal life. Now the Christians that are being addressed here have already done this in a greater sense. 
They have died to sin. And they've been raised to walk in new spiritual life as Christians. Now this letter is also addressed to us today. Not just to some people in some part of the world far removed 2,000 years ago. This letter is written to us today. Christ praises his church that has suffered trials for their faith. And we've all faced trials for our faith. Some greater, some less. We don't need to go through life with a martyr complex and feel that we're persecuted and everything that happens to us. But we all face those choices that we have to make on behalf of God. To be a follower of Christ means making some choices, making some sacrifices. We've all faced them. And Christ praises His church that has suffered these trials for faith. And He prepares us for further trials by warning them that they're becoming. And He warns us persecutions will come as well to everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ. And He gives the prescription to overcome these trials. How do we endure? How do we get through this? We remain faithful. We trust in the Word that's been revealed by the Holy Spirit. The Bible. We read it, we understand it, we study it, and we live it. That's how we overcome. That's how we endure to the end. If we do that, if we endure the trials of this life, we'll be rewarded with the crown of eternal life. And we'll be spared eternal death of being separated from God. Christ wanted to encourage those people in the first century. And he wants to encourage everyone here today to make the same commitment. Now, just like in real estate, location matters. Are you in Christ? Are you located in Christ? You get into Christ by being baptized into Christ, by obeying the gospel, by believing these words of his son, by repenting of your sin, by confessing Jesus as Lord, being immersed in water that your sins might be washed away. That's how you locate yourself in Christ and be where... He wants you to be where you can be blessed, where you can be protected. It may be that you already are a Christian. That you've done this at some point in the past, but maybe you've lost your confidence. Maybe you've got let that fear creep back in, that doubt. Am I really going to make it through this? If you've lost your confidence, then let Christ build that back up in you again so that you can face the struggles of life with Him by your side. He's always been there. We just need to recognize it and see it. We can pray for you this morning that you might be encouraged or that you might surrender your will to God's will and accept the blessing that he so longs to give you. Forgiveness of your sins and eternal life. If you would do that, if we can pray for you in anything you may have a need of the church this morning, please come as we stand and sing. Hear my soul, I will you linger, wandering from.